So in this video, we're going to talk about Next.js 15 that was released last week on October 21st. We also had the Next.js Conf last week where the team talked a lot about the new features in Next.js 15, but also what's coming uh, in the future in terms of caching and partial pre-rendering, which we're going to touch on now. Uh, some of the APIs in Next.js 15 is actually paving the way for the way partial pre-rendering is going to work in future. Now, we have had videos on the channel talking about what's coming in Next.js 15 and React 19, which was tied into the release candidate of Next.js 15 back uh, five, six months ago, but we're going to touch from a high level what's now stable in Next.js 15 and what's coming down the line. So let me just turn this into full screen so we have more space. And we're going to go over this blog post that was uh, released from the team highlighting what's coming in Next.js 15. Now, you might have already known, as I mentioned, we've talked about the release candidate of Next.js 15 previously. There was two release candidates, and this new version of Next.js 15 is basically the combination of the changes combined in those two release candidates. Now, if you want to upgrade your Next.js to the latest version, you can use this next code mod, which is basically a CLI tool, a script you can run that scans through your code and walks you through this upgrade. We're going to have a dedicated video for migrating Next.js to the latest version. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but you can try it out. It's a nice way of actually going through these changes. If you want to also upgrade uh, manually, you can just run this npm install or depending on your package manager to install the latest version of Next.js and also the RC flags for React because Next.js 15 depends on React 19, which is a still in release candidate. So you have to pass in these flags to manually upgrade your Next.js. Now, there's a list of all the changes here. We're going to go through them one by one. The first one is the introduction of that code mod command you can run. So we've already talked about that. Now, let's talk about the first major change as it comes in Next.js APIs. Now, request APIs are now asynchronous. By request APIs, we are really meaning the dynamic functions we had in Next.js, things like cookies, headers, search params. These were functions that you can call to get request-specific data, uh, which was also opting your pages out of the static rendering because you needed access to this request-specific data. Well, it is request-specific, so it is only known at runtime. You cannot know this information ahead of the time to pre-build or pre-render these pages at build time. Therefore, they were dynamic as soon as you would use these functions. Uh, and now they're marked as asynchronous. So previously, you, you could just call cookies, for example, without it being asynchronous and get the cookies, headers, and search params. But now they're marked as asynchronous. And the primary reason for this is <clears throat> for partial pre-rendering. This is the way that Next.js is going to understand what parts of your application is dynamic. Now, if you're not familiar with partial pre-rendering, uh, there's a video on the channel. I'm going to link it in the description and also in the show notes where we talk about what it is and how you can actually um, write your code now so that you have um, a smooth transition to use partial pre-rendering if you're already applying um, the structure or the code the way that React is supposed to be written inside of server components, primarily using suspense boundaries. So watch that video. But um, the way that it used to work before was that these functions was throwing an error, uh, and that's why how uh, how Next.js was, de was detecting the use of these functions. But now they are marked with promises, so they're returning promises, and that's how Next.js is deciding what part of your application is dynamic. Now, this is a little too much detail about how Next.js works behind the scenes, um, but the reason for turning this request a specific APIs into asynchronous is what's coming next into partial pre-rendering. There's an amazing talk by one of Vercel's team members that's working on partial pre-rendering um, on the Next.js conf. I'm going to also link that in the description for you to watch to understand how this ties into partial pre-rendering. But all you need to know in Next.js 15 now is that these are asynchronous. Now, 
you can still use them as synchronous functions. You're going to get an error if you use them as synchronous, but be prepared to use them in an asynchronous way or you know, gradually migrate your code if you're using these dynamic APIs. Now, caching semantics, we've had um, conversations about caching on the channel and videos. We had an amazing video with Delba from Vercel about caching in Next.js, which seems to be a pain point for developers when working with new versions of Next.js in the app router. Now, the app router was very opinionated in terms of caching defaults, trying to optimize your app as much as possible. And this has created some confusions in the dev community, not understanding how this really works. It was also complicated because there was different layers of caching from the server to the router in the browser and the HTTP cache. And synchronizing all of this together or making sense of it was hard. So therefore, in Next.js 15, they have rolled this back or the default to be um, non-caching. So by default, previously, all of your pages would have been static unless you would use a dynamic function, for example, or you specify your page or your route to be uh, uh, not cached. But now uh, everything is dynamic unless you opt into caching, which should make everything easy. So you can just uh, make it work first and then think about optimization and caching next. Whereas in previous versions of Next.js, it came in optimized from the start. And sometimes you had to fight your way into making it dynamic or getting your dy dynamic data working. Primarily, if you didn't know how the APIs work, it would have been a bit confusing. But long story short, now everything is back to being dynamic unless you actually opt into static we have talked about caching with Delbo. I'm going to link that video um, in the link uh, in the description or somewhere in the cart. Watch that if you want to understand caching in Next.js a bit more. We also have different videos on the channel where we talk about the dynamic versus the static rendering, the different strategies. Uh, because ultimately, even if now the default is uh, dynamic or it's not cached, <coughs> it's still important to understand how these APIs work. Because after you know you make your application work, there is going to be a point where you want to optimize your app and uh, benefit from caching. So it's important to understand how this works. Now, this new caching behavior is applied to your route handlers, your uh, page components. For example, your get route handlers were cached by default. So if you had an API route that was responding to get requests, it was cached by default. Um, and now it's not. A lot of people didn't understand why it was or thought it doesn't make sense. To me, it makes sense if it is not depending on request specific information. Even if it's an API endpoint, it can still be cached, but it is now rolled back to being dynamic. So router cache no longer caches page components by default. This is um, more confusing than any other parts of caching in my uh, experience. The router cache is referring to the cache inside of the browser where Next.js was actually caching the result of server component payloads. So if you had navigated to a page and navigated you know, between different pages, Instead of sending a request back to the server to get the same server payload, Next.js was using the router cache inside of the browser to just uh, use the same payload that you had before, um, oftentimes resulting in some confusions for the developers not understanding why um, things are not working the way that it, it does. The stale time flag was introduced, uh, I think, in Next.js 14.2. Um, but now... Again, it's defaulting not no longer to cache any page components. If you want to opt in into caching again, you can just set this stale time dynamic to 30. It's basically setting the stale time to zero now. So therefore, it's not caching anything. If you want to go back to the previous <coughs> behavior, you can just set it back to dynamic 30. So as part of Next.js 15, as I mentioned, um, 
it depends on React 19. React 19 is still in release candidate. There is a video on the channel where I talk about what's coming into React 19 in depth. So definitely watch that video because this is the future of React and also Next.js. Uh, well, for Next.js, it's not the future. We're already using the new APIs in React 19, but it's very good to understand what's coming in React 19. So definitely watch that video if you haven't already. Now, there's a backward compatibility for the Pages Router. If you're using React 19, you, so you can still continue using React, 9, React 18 inside the Pages Router if you want. The latest version of Next.js 15 in the App Router depends on React 19. Um, but you could still build applications inside the page, Pages Router. There's still a ton of Next.js apps inside the Pages Router. So they can go to Next.js 15, use the new features, but still use React 18 inside the Pages Router if you want to. The Next.js 15 or the new version uh, supports React Compiler as an experimental feature. There's a video again on the channel where I dive deeper into what React Compiler is. It's basically uh, in a tool from React team that understands JavaScript and rules of React and optimizes your code automatically without you having to use APIs such as use memo or use callback. And Next.js 15 now supports this. Again, watch the video that we have on the channel. It's very interesting what the React team is doing and the future of React, which is um, very exciting. It, um, for having better user experiences for more optimized apps. Improvement with the hydration errors. Um, this has been a pain point for anyone that has built applications with Next.js. Um, there has been improvements for the errors that you're getting. Uh, before, we didn't have the stack. Now we have the stack, and the team is just making more improvements in understanding where the error is coming from. Now, if you're not familiar with the hydration errors, it's when the HTML that was rendered on the server is different from what's rendered on the client, and the mismatch creates this hydration error. It's typically uh, caused by stuff like you can see here. So for example, you're using a variable such as date.now or math.random, which changes each time it is called. So therefore, when it was called on the server, it's different from when it was called on the client. If you're using date formatting or anything doing with dates, really, when they are rendered on the server differently from the client, they can uh, create these hydration errors. <coughs> or if you are using invalid HTML tag nesting, you're going to get the same error too now it gives you more information into where this is coming from, what the possible causes are, and what was rendered on the server versus on the client, which is going to help you debug your application. Now, Turbo Pack is stable now for development. Turbo Pack is a build tool for, it's. I think it's a Rust-based um, build tool. And now it's a stable in dev, still not in production, but in dev. And it is really important if you have ever suffered from a low um, development server when you're working with Next.js. So primarily, if you're using a Windows um, machine, when you're running Next.js on local dev or the local server, it's very slow. Uh, the initial load is slow. Anytime you make changes are slow. And if you use Turbo Pack, uh, it's going to speed up your startup time, your fast refreshes. So anytime you make changes and you save, you would in, um, you would see the results or the updates faster. <coughs> so definitely a huge improvement for Windows users, but also for Mac users. I've uh, Next.js local server is very um, resource intensive and can be very slow. And Turbo Pack is now stable. Now, all you need to do is to run next dev dash dash turbo. When you're installing a new Next.js app, it asks you whether or not you want to run Turbo. And if you do, it just changes the script in your package JSON to add the dash dash turbo. But if you just want to also run this on your own, you can just run um, passing that this dash dash turbo to your dev command. Um, now, static route indicator is uh, this little sign on any page that's now static. Um, I think there are going to more develop. Uh, there are going to be more developer tools coming into the Next.js ecosystem, where it helps you understand how your 
application is working and one of which is this static route flag that is going to show up on the left bottom corner of any page that's rendered statically. So you can visually see if this is a dynamic page or a static page and understand if you're expecting a dynamic page or a static, you can just make sure. Now we used to have this inside of the pages router, uh, something very similar uh, that would show this is a static route because in the pages router you would use um, different APIs like get static props that would turn your page into a static page. So it was very um, specific for Next.js to understand what page is a uh, is a static. And also we had the get server side props, which was server side and it was just dynamic. Um, so we had this, it went away, um, I guess after the introduction of the app router, but now they're bringing it back so that they would give more tools to developers to understand how Next.js is working. I think even more dev tools are coming in the Next.js ecosystem, but this is maybe the start of um, new tools. Now, we have had this after um, function that allows you to run code after response has been uh, sent or streamed to the browser or to the client. Um, we've talked about this before, but basically what it does is that you could call this after function and it's going to run this callback function you pass to it or just execute this function you pass to it after the response has been sent to the client. This is useful if you want to run code that's not necessarily the concern of your user. So for example, if you want to log, if you want to do some analytics or you know, synchronize with external systems, your users shouldn't be waiting for this task to be done. This can be done after a response has been sent to your user. So therefore, this after function is going to allow you to do that. Now the problem is, Usually, your server, uh, your server components are deployed as serverless functions, and several serverless functions are living inside this ephemeral containers that are going to die after the response closes. So this is going to um, allow your serverless container or function to still um, stay alive while you're performing this other task after you have sent the response to the client, which is um, exciting. Now, instrumentation.js, it's um, an API for observability in Next.js. So if for error handling, um, you can use now um, a new API or a new function, really, or a new hook from Sentry um, and hook in whatever SDK that you're using for your logging system or error handling into your Next.js app. So we're going to have more videos about this on the channel. We haven't really talked about error handling uh, in terms of external services such as Sentry before, uh, which I think it will be interesting to talk about. This is now stable. Um, so I'm going to have a follow-up follow -up video on this to understand how you would use or set up Sentry, for example, as a service um, <clears throat> for your Next.js apps in terms of observability, error handling, and logging. Now, a new component is introduced in Next.js called Form from NextForm, which is really interesting. Again, I'm going to have a dedicated video on this, but basically this encapsulates um, three things mainly inside of it. So it's going to give you prefetching. So when you want to navigate to, let's say, a different page once a form is submitted, for example, there's a query input here, and once the user types in, you're going to send them to forward slash search, where this query is going to be appended to that forward slash search as a query string. And then on that page, you can just fetch the necessary data depending on what they're searching for. Now, this is going to prefetch the UI, the loading, and also the layout of that page that you're going to. It is going to also perform a client-side navigation, whereas if you use a form, a, a, an HTML form, it's going to do a full refresh. Um, this is going to do a client-side navigation, and therefore your layouts and client-side state are going to be preserved, so it's a smooth client-side um, navigation. But it is going to also give you progressive enhancement in that if JavaScript is not loaded, it is still works as a regular form that is going to just do a full refresh and go to this forward slash search. Now, one thing I want to clarify here is that it's just not 
um, only for if you wanted to go to a different page. You could still stay on the same page. If you pass an empty string to this action prop, it stays on the same page and passes this query as a query string to that appends it to the current URL. So it's not only if you want to go to a new page, you can just use it to stay on the same page as well. Now to this action, you can also pass in a server action, like a function, to do mutations on the server. So the way that we have been using forms um, to use mutations or do mutations before you can still use it with this form component. So really you can pass in either a string, which is the path to where you want this form submission to go, or you can pass a function, which is a server action to do any mutation. Um, there's a link to the form component in the docs where it shows different examples. I'm going to have a video about this as well to see how this can benefit because it encapsulates a lot of custom codes that you need to write um, if you're not using the form component. And I'm assuming more APIs are going to come to this form component in future. But for now, uh, we're going to have a video about this new form component. So stay tuned. Now, next config.ts can now be a TypeScript file. If you have paid attention before, this is usually a JavaScript file, and then <coughs> you are trying to bring in types into it. Uh, but now it's it can be a TypeScript file. Um, now, improvement on self-hosting. Um, there's a video by Lee Robb where he talks about self-hosting and actually deploys uh, or self-hosts an XJS app on a VPS. So I'm going to include a link in the description for that as well. Uh, we're going to have probably a video about self-hosting Next.js apps in in near future. This has been a topic that I have been asked a lot from folks in the community to understand how you would go about um, getting the same experience from caching and static rendering and image optimization when you're self-hosting Next.js, it's been um, difficult to actually get the same behavior as you would get on Vercel. So we're going to have this in a separate video, but um, it seems like the team is making an effort into making it easier to self-host Next.js applications so that you're not tied to only use Vercel. So that's interesting to see. Now, something I want to talk about, and I have talked about before on the channel, is enhanced security for server actions. Now, server actions are functions that you define on the server, but you can call from the client side. So they expose an API endpoint uh, to the client side. Now, just like any other API endpoint, you need to secure it yourself. It's just a public API endpoint. Um, but this hasn't been so obvious for folks using it, thinking that they're defining a function on the server um, and they don't need to protect it because they didn't know it, it would be a public API endpoint, has created some security concerns, and they have mitigated some of the those concerns by eliminating the code that you're not using. So if you're defining a server action but never using it, never importing it inside of a client component, they're going to eliminate that, basically not creating any API endpoints for it. And also they are changing um, the IDs for the server actions, which is the way that you would call the server actions to be unguessable and non-deterministic because anytime you would serve, you would define a server action. As I mentioned, it would turn into an API endpoint uh, with a specific ID that you could see on inside the browser, inside your JavaScript code, and any anyone who would access, who could access that ID could basically call your API endpoint. And if you haven't protected your um, server actions with authentication or authorization, it could have exposed your app into security vulnerabilities there. Um, so they have made some improvements into those IDs, so they can't, so somebody can't really guess your IDs, but uh, even with this, um, I wouldn't depend on any uh, on this to secure your server actions. You should still validate any data that comes from client side inside your server actions, inside your server. Even if you have validate that data inside your client side code, you you still always validate and sanitize the data that's coming from the client side, 
and you authorize and authenticate the user if it is a protect protected route, for example, inside of your API endpoint, as you would do with any API endpoint. Server Actions is just going to make it easy for you so that you don't have to create those API endpoints yourself. You just define functions and it just takes care of the rest um, itself under the hood, but you still need to protect your server actions. Now, ex uh, optimizing bundling for external packages. Uh, now, in the app router, by default, it is going to bundle all the external packages that you're using into your server bundle. And because you're now running server-side code in your cold starts, you might experience delays or you know, slow run time, slow cold starts if you're having um, uh, packages that take time to load up in the bundle. And you can um, eliminate them from being bundled with this uh, server, exter server external packages. Now, inside the pages router, they did not bundle server side packages by default. Um, you can also pass a flag to. Um, bundle uh, the pages router dependencies but eliminate anything that you don't want to be inside the server bundle so this is mainly for optimization purposes but uh, I've had problems in the past where I was using specific packages in my MDX rendering for a portfolio and let's say I was using syntax highlighting or I don't remember the specific package that I was using, but it wasn't being bundled um, inside my pages router. So I had to specifically tell it to bundle using these transpile packages. Um, so you would know it if you have come across an error like this or if you have had, um, you know, performance issues with your cold starts on the server or really optimizing external packages when you're running your code. Now, ESLint 8 is going to be deprecated. It's already deprecated on October 5th, 2024. So Nexus 15 is still using ESLint 8. You can upgrade to 9 and it supports the 9 and I recommend doing it. It has better rules or more strict rules in terms of implementing React rules inside of your Nexus projects, which is going to help you um, avoid bugs that are going to catch you down the road. So you can just upgrade to ESLint 9 and Next.js 15 is going to support that. Now, there is also improvements to development and build um, server components, hot module reload. I'm not so sure about this. So what this is doing is caching the results of your server components. So when you are refreshing, so let's say you're making changes in development and anytime you make a change and you save, you have this thing that says that's hot mod, hot module reload that is going to make you see the updates inside of your local dev server by rerunning the server component. So if you are calling any fetch, for example, it just reruns those requests. And if those fetch requests are really hitting your production database or APIs that cost you money, Anytime you're in your development as you're saving and making updates, you're just incurring costs. So to mitigate that, they have introduced this new cache for server components, HMR, that is going, going to use the cached version of the server component instead of having to make that fetch request again, um, <clears throat> which I think is going to create some confusions if you are, for example, updating your server component, but you're not getting um, the recent fresh data is one of the reasons why people got confused with uh, Next.js caching in the first place. Um, so I'm not sure if this is going to create more confusion or not, but it's, it is a way for you to at least um, not incur costs when you are developing and when you're updating your code, you can still use your cache, but knowing that this is going to use a cache instead of refetching the data um, is interesting faster static generation for the app router you can read through this um, advanced controls that you can pass into your next config for static site generation and other changes that's coming to other components 
Um, Next image is going to use Sharp. This is going to actually be automatically installed in the new versions of Next.js 15 in an attempt to make it easier to self-host Next.js 15. Um, really some minor changes. Some of them are breaking. They are not minor, but um, you can just read through these changes and, app and you know take note of what applies to your specific use case. Um, really... That's all I wanted to talk about today. Now, what's interesting or what's coming down the line um, in terms of Next.js, there's another blog post uh, from Sebastian Markbedge. Um, sorry if I'm not pronouncing the last name correctly. And that's the journey of caching uh, in Next.js. And the new primitives introduced into Next.js, I would definitely recommend reading through this. We're going to have a video on this new directives um, in Next.js and the way caching uh, or different rendering strategies are going to work in terms of static versus dynamic. Um, As a teaser, you would have this use cache directive to use it just really like the use server compo- uh, the use server directive which turns um, your files into server actions the use cache is going to instruct nextjs to cache this specific page or component that you're using so you can use this directive really anywhere you can use it inside pages inside individual components or inside your asynchronous functions that fetch data whether you're using the fetch api or your database clients you can use this use cache and it just signals to nextjs to use the uh, cache for this specific uh, part of your application. Um, You can have dynamic and static or cached versions of components used together. You can have cached functions. Again, we're going to have videos about this as this is going to develop. This is still not in Next.js 15. This is Uh, the APIs that is coming down in Next.js in the future. If you want to use this, you can can use them in the Canary version of Next.js today. Uh, Ways to tag specific um, cache and uh, define different lifetimes for your cache, revalidate these caches, uh, and how this thing is going to tie into partial pre-rendering in future. Again, this is another primitive for Next.js to understand what parts of your app is dynamic and what parts is static. The first change was the request APIs, such as cookies and headers, are now marked as asynchronous. That's one way of understanding that this is a dynamic part of your app. (coughs) And this use cache directive is another one to mark components or data fetching functions as static. So Next.js can understand how to, you know, interleave these two static and dynamic parts of your application into uh, partial pre-rendering, which is really uh, the benefit of static at the um, the speed of static at the customizability or flexibility of dynamic all in one. Um, in so at component level, so you don't have to decide at page level whether it's dynamic or static. It can still be at component level or function level here. Now again, if you wanted to. Um, understand partial pre-rendering there's a video on the channel where you can understand how to structure your code from now so that when it comes down the line you are you can just use it there's not much you need to do really in terms of marking your dynamic parts as um, wrapping your dynamic components with the suspense boundary so it's really built on suspense and promises as we just saw previously. So watch that video uh, and read through this blog post, which is interesting to know why they're doing what they're doing and where the future of caching in Next.js and partial pre-rendering is going to be. There are some videos from Lerop that I mentioned, Delba, and another team member from Vercel talking about this stuff in Next.js Conf, all of which are linked in the description. And with that is a wrap for this video folks if you have any questions like always hit me up in the comments and i'll see you in the next one bye bye